Hey, hey, good morning, everyone. How are we doing this morning? Hot? Cool. Yeah, if you're working in the heat this week, my heart goes out to you. It's been hot. Um, we're going to get started with the Dollar Club Ministry. If you're unfamiliar with that, these guys will be coming around. If you have an extra dollar that you can throw in there, we would appreciate it. We use that during the week to help someone in our community. Uh, we also you take that moment to share the love of Christ with, with individuals. This week, we were able to help someone with some housing uh, situations that they were having. So give yourself a hand. Give God a hand for allowing us the opportunity to do that. If you are visiting, uh, welcome to Matthew's Table. My name is Charlie Doherty. I'm one of the worship leaders here with my wife. And uh, if, you, if you're visiting, take a look at the seat back in front of you. There's a QR code. And if you scan that QR code with whatever device that you're using, it'll take you to the website. You can check on things like the calendar and different events coming up. But also, there is a Connect card. And if you're visiting, we'd like for you to fill that Connect card out so we'll know you were here and we can uh, reach out to you. One of the pastors can reach out to you as well. Um, also... If you are visiting, the restrooms are located in the back, or for all of you that, that attend regularly. You know, the restrooms are in the back. The men's are on my left. I got this wrong last week. My left, women's on my right. And if you would use those uh, during the service, we'd appreciate it. It helps keep distractions down from activity of people running up back and forth. But if you, uh, if you need to use the restroom and the stairs are, are an issue, just there are restrooms down this hall, know that, you can use those as well. But we're glad you're here. If you can, take uh, just a few moments, say hello to the person next to you, and we'll start this worship service in just a few. Okay, family, if we could find us a seat, please. Um, I do want to remind everybody that next Sunday, which is August the 6th, I will have the prayer chart for Aiden McLaughlin, where everybody had signed up to pray through his crucible evaluation. So uh, if you forgot to take a picture or forgot which slot you signed up for, you can check it up here next week and you'll be able to be reminded. As Jessica mentioned earlier, we now have a, uh, instead of mobile prayer room, I should say probably satellite, satellite prayer room downstairs. It's down these back steps over here. If you're not comfortable to come to this prayer room, or if you're just shy and don't want to get up in front of everybody, we will be downstairs in the back. And we also have a prayer jar there for prayer requests. So we want you all to feel free to come. And uh, if you need prayer to be prayed over or prayer requests, we want you to feel free to do that. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, please. Most gracious Father, Thank you for the many blessings that you have given us every single day. But the blessing we are most thankful for is Jesus Christ, your son, so that we may have opportunity to follow him as Lord and Savior and be the hands and feet, to be the light and salt in this world that you have called us to be, to love each other, and to love you first and foremost, and to not neglect the things that you would have us do. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray, amen. Good morning, church. 
Welcome to the table. If this is your first time here, we are so glad that you have joined us this morning. Sorry for the air conditioner. I know you guys are freezing. We're doing our best here. Um, we do have a fan, so we're trying to cool off the room a little bit. We thank you for your patience with that. You know, one of the cool things about being from the Owensboro area is that you can look at any random person and say, it's hot, Don, and they know exactly what you're talking about. And I think that's beautiful. So... Anyway, that has nothing to do with announcements, but I do have a few announcements for you. Uh, tonight is marriage night. If you are married or thinking about becoming married, our marriage ministry is the place to be. Uh, that's at 5 p.m. tonight in the fellowship hall, which is the room directly below this room. It's just a great time to have your relationship poured into, so be sure to go to that tonight at 5 o'clock. This upcoming Saturday is our back to school bash. It's from 1 to 3 p.m. There will be games and food and snow cones and all kinds of fun stuff. I heard some pastors are going to be dunked that day. I unfortunately will be sick that day, but the rest of them should have a good time. So it is, if your uh, child participates in kids' table, they can get three balls for a dollar. Um, if uh, you're an adult, then it's one dollar per ball, and I want all of you to dunk Roger Chilton as many times as possible. Speaking of kids' table, we are in need of some volunteers for our kids' ministry. So if you are someone who would love to help out and serve in that way, we would love to have you. There is a sign-up sheet at the welcome desk where you can sign up. Um, you won't be expected to teach or prepare a lesson. These are more for classroom assistant type roles, um, but it is uh, it, it takes an entire village and then some to be able to wrangle all the kids back there. And so it really is a blessing to be able to serve and not only a blessing to them, but a blessing to you. So if that's something that you're interested in, be sure to sign up and Bambi will get with you and get you some more details about that. And we appreciate you serving in that way. I also do want to mention uh, today is the fifth Sunday of the month. And if you've been around Matthew's table this year, earlier this year, we decided that on the months that have a fifth Sunday, on that fifth Sunday, our giving will go to a special cause in the community. So earlier this year, we gave to My Sister's Keeper. We've given to a couple other places. Uh, this, today, our giving is going to go toward our Faust Elementary Outreach Program. Earlier this year, we adopted Faust Elementary and all the students and parents and families and the teachers. And so this year, we've had the opportunity to bless those guys. Um, at, we had a parent-teacher conference where we bought pizzas for every family. That was really cool. We've been able to uh, do some really nice things for some of the teachers and take care of some of the kiddos down there. And it really has been not only a blessing to them, but really a blessing to us as well. And so the giving today will go toward um, all the things that our outreach team is going to do as we're starting a new school year for Faust um, and, and, well, all of DCPS. And so uh, you can give through uh, the Church Center app. You can scan that QR code on the seat back in front of you to give, or you can drop that in the black box as you leave the room. But we thank you for your generous giving in that and helping us to be able to show Jesus to the community. So let's continue this morning in worship. How's everyone doing today? Wow. Wow. Is this on? <clears throat> Before we get started, can you turn me up just a little bit, Joey? Before we get started, I want, to, uh, I want to take just a moment. How many people was with us when we were at the Monday Center? Yeah, cool. When we started at the Monday Center, it was, it was Brandy and I. Um, Zachary was there as well. He was doing sound for us, and he now plays guitar with us. But uh, when we started, it was just us, and our prayer was that God would bring us musicians that had a heart for worship, musicians and vocalists that had a heart for worship. And he's certainly done that, but he, he also blessed us with some extremely talented people. Um, I don't know if we realize how blessed we are here. We, we have wonderful, incredible musicians and, and vocalists that are here with us every week. And we try to honor them in a couple of different ways. One way that we do that is we don't typically have any kind of rehearsal during the week. We show up early on Sunday, run through the songs. And, um, and that way, everybody's just showing up prepared. Uh, they prepare during the week, but we're not taking that time away from family during the week to do that. And then secondly, we like to, on every fifth Sunday, just give them off. They don't have to prepare that week. They can just show up, spend time with their family, and be a part of the service. And so that's, that's what's happening this week. It's the fifth Sunday. Brittany and I will be leading. But we're just so blessed to have them. And if you would, could you just join me in honoring that group of musicians and vocalists this morning? We love you guys.
Well, good morning, church. I want to start off this morning with some scripture that I'm, I'm studying through the book of Luke right now. And the word is alive and active and, and living. And I've studied through Luke multiple times. Um, but you can read scriptures that you've read a hundred times and it's that one time it just smacks you in the face. And this passage has just been just churning in my heart for weeks um, and I've just been chewing on it. It's in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, and it says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not practice what I tell you? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not practice what I tell you? Why do you come in here on Sunday and lift your hands and call me Lord, Lord, but then you don't do what I ask you to do Monday through Saturday? That has really stuck with me, and it's, it's a great heart check. You know, those moments when God gives us those heart checks. And then over in chapter 7, there's a story that we're told, and given how Jesus went and moved into a, another town. And as he was coming into this town, there was literally a funeral possession happening at that moment. They were, they were coming out with the body of this young man that had passed away. And he saw that the mother of this young man, of course, was grieving and had compassion on her. She was a widow. And so she had no one else probably to take care of her. Her son had just died. And he had compassion, and he actually stopped the funeral possession and raised this young man from the dead and brought him back to life and gave his mama back his son. And, of course, there were, you know, crowds had come to in honor and respect of this family. And the passage says in chapter 17 that the people prof were profound and reverent fear seized them all, and they began to recognize God and praise and give thanks. Did y'all catch that? They were seized with profound and reverent fear. They saw him rightly as he is. And because of that, they were able to recognize God as he is, high and lifted up, the Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega, the creator of all that we see. They recognized God, and then they gave praise and thanksgiving. We, in this room, that is my prayer, that is my husband's prayer, Sunday after Sunday, that as we gather, we will see him rightly, that we will come in with an understanding of who it is we serve, because if you are in Christ in this room, you were once dead, and you have been made alive in Christ Jesus, and I pray that we see him and remember it is who saved us and raised us from that grave, and we are able to release praise and thanksgiving this morning, amen. Oh, 
and lift it up. Shift our hearts and our minds and our attentions to your face, God.
because you're so worthy. And all that I have is a Cause Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. Yes, and Jesus, we. you make us strong instead you took these rags and you made us beautiful yes for all that you've done we will pour out our love this will be our anthem song oh Jesus we So 
just want you to close your eyes. If you know the song, great. If not, I just want you to soak. I just want you to be present with your Savior this morning. Be intentional. Increase the hunger and thirst in this place this morning, God, that we would long for nothing else but you. Increase the fire within our bones, Lord, that we would burn for only you, God. And the things of this world that try to pull and distract us and promise us all these empty, broken things, they have nothing compared to you, God. May we just throw that aside it off of us and run to the cross of Christ, God. Do all we want is you, your heart desire, our longing, God. All, everything we need is found at your feet, Lord. Everything we need is found in Christ and Christ alone. Lord, help us to fall more in love with you we can turn our back on the junk and the things of this world that don't matter. I pray again, increase our hunger and our thirst, God. Tear down the idols. The only altar on our hearts would be yours. Because Jesus, we love Church, you can be seated. We're going to move into a time of Holy Communion. Communion is a time that we remember the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross through the elements of bread and juice. There's a cup in the seat back in front of you. 
if you can't get to one, raise your hands and one of our deacon will, one of our deacons will bring that by for you. Now, before we take the elements, I want to talk a little bit about what this means. Because not only is communion a time that we remember Christ's sacrifice on the cross, but it's also a time when we remember our relationship with him. It's a time that we come before God asking the Holy Spirit to convict us of areas where we've fallen short in our relationship with him. And so before we partake in the elements this morning, let's have just a few moments of silent meditation. Ask for the Holy Spirit's conviction in those areas. Where can you turn those things over to him? Let's reflect. As we prepare to take the elements, it's important to remember that the bread and the juice are symbols. There's nothing magical about these elements, but scripture does say that partaking in communion is specifically reserved for believers. So if you have not come to a saving relationship in Jesus Christ this morning, we ask that you uh, don't partake in the elements. In the book of 1 Corinthians, it says, the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You can take the bread. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. You may take the juice. And the passage ends by saying, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. We are so thankful for that. Let's take a moment and pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for these gifts of bread and juice, but more importantly, Lord, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. Lord, we are so undeserving of your love and grace, your kindness and your mercy. But just like the elements of the communion table. You give yourself freely to us. Lord, may we never forget that sacrifice. With all humility and gratitude, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Good morning. All right, my name is Tony, and I know some of you, and hopefully I'll get a chance to meet most of the rest of you. I, um, I just want you to know that the reason I'm standing here today instead of Roger or any of the other pastors is Roger told me that if I could whip him, that I could preach this last Sunday. So you know what happened after that, and he won't tell you that. He won't let you know, but he submitted. We're great, grateful to be in this place today. I know God has brought us here, and I know God has met us here. Uh, I usually preach down the street, down at Goose Egg Park at Eaton Memorial Baptist Church, but I'm here today, and, and I want you to know that we're all on the same team, and that the same God that we worship there is the God we worship here, and it's our same hope there as here as anywhere else, so I'm thankful for that. I want you to know that I, we never want you to hear the message of the church being this, God is good, you're bad, so try harder. You ever heard that? Uh, inadvertently, sometimes preachers can mention something like that. Hey, God's good. You all are really bad. Let's just do better this week and go on and move on. No, it, it, that's not the solution. In fact, it can't work that way. We know that Jesus Christ did not come and die so to make bad people good. 
He came and died to make dead people alive. He came and died so that the captives could be set free. He came and died so that the lame could walk, so that the blind eyes could see. And it's that Jesus that we worship here today. And I'm thankful that you all serve that same Jesus. A few weeks ago, Roger started this mini-series by talking about the, the person of Jacob and his season of wrestling with God. And he talked about how after he committed his life and surrendered his life to the will of God, he walked away from that encounter with a limp and he walked away with a new name. His name was changed to Israel and he walked for the rest of his life, as far as we know, with a limp. But he could walk, which is an amazing thing. The reality is he was wrestling with God. And as a person who wrestles with God, the fact that we can walk after it's over is absolutely an amazing grace for us. You know, Jacob was able to walk even though he walked with a limp and, and God had toyed with him for a little bit during that episode. I don't know if you remember the story, but he wrestled and seemed like he was doing pretty good for a while. And then there was a moment at the end of the wrestling match when God touched his fingertip to the hip of Jacob and took him out. I'm telling you, that fingertip to the hip was worse than any cross-faced chicken wing you guys had ever seen. It was an amazing move, and God made Jacob surrender to his will. Of course, then, the two weeks ago, Zach preached to us about forgiveness and how essential forgiveness is in the life of a believer. He told us that forgiven people forgive people, and that still holds true today. And last week, Joe reminded us about grief and loss and how we need to hold on to Jesus as our only source of strength through grief and loss. I love the fact that as I got a chance to listen to each of these messages, they were all speaking directly to me. And I hope that all of us have grown through this little four-part or five-part mini-series that Matthew's Table is doing. This morning, I want to change the gear just a little bit and tell you that it's been... Um, a rough journey, and today is one of the first times that in a church setting I'm really coming out with some of this story. You see, on Christmas morning 2016 at Beaverdam Baptist Church in Beaverdam, Kentucky, I stood in front of the entire congregation and I confessed to the sin of adultery. That day I stepped down from senior pastor at Beaverdam Baptist Church. I stepped down and my wife had found out what was going on and she had filed for divorce. I signed those divorce papers on December the 16th, 2016. I was face to face with my sin and my world was broken completely apart. Two days before Christmas that year, I sat down with my two children. They were six years old and nine years old at the time. And I told them that I had sinned against God and against their mom and against them and that our lives were going to be dramatically and drastically changed from then on. I told them all of this in knowing that my life was absolutely chaotic. I can't begin to describe to you the pain that I felt during those moments and those days, but as deep as my pain was, my wife's pain was deeper still. You see, I'd found myself in a place very similar to King David of the Bible. King David of the Bible uh, had done some very similar things. And although I would never consider myself like David at all, David was a great man of God after God's own heart. But today what I want to do is I want to look at David's response to God after his sin was found out. And I want to tell you some good news. I'm not going to keep you long. Rod said I got about two hours tops, so um, just hang out. What I want to tell you, though, is incredible news today because it, it, is, um, it leads us to absolute, complete healing, forgiveness, restoration, and freedom. But there's a pathway there. I want you to know that I'm not coming to you today as a preacher who runs effortlessly through life with all of the answers and no problems at all. You, you know some of those preachers, right? But I'm coming to you limping along knowing exactly what this process looks like, how hard it is, in fact, how almost impossible it is, and how amazing it is when God puts it all back together. 
So I'm coming to you today limping, but I'm limping with Jesus. So today we're going to camp out in Psalm 51. And before I get too far, I want to read that psalm with you. If you don't mind, please stand out of reverence for the reading of the word. You don't have to, but it's a good idea. We're going to read the entire psalm today. To the choir master, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would have given it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart you will not despise. Do good in Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. This, of course, is a famous psalm. It's a psalm that many of us have heard, and some of us, it has become our anthem in our life. It's a psalm that we look at and realize it ought to be the posture of every Christian in the church today. This psalm ought to be the posture, but our temptation is not to let this be our anthem. Our temptation is to move beyond repentance and start to get proud in our spiritual life. We, we have a tendency as believers to get puffed up and pumped up in our own righteousness rather than relying on the righteousness of Christ. So we move beyond or try to move beyond this posture of repentance in our life. I look at this psalm today and realize how important it has been in my life. And I wonder if any of us have ever come to the place where David found himself right before he wrote this psalm. This morning, as we camp out together, I want you to understand that as this attitude of repentance becomes our attitude, we start to realize the only true freedom comes from the only one who can put us back together where we are broken. It's the only one that we can throw our life into and onto and beg for his mercy. I want to look today at three things, and then I'll sit down. I won't keep you forever, but I want to look at three things. The first one is the grace of exposure. The second one is the grace of repentance. And the third one is the grace of a new heart. The grace of exposure, repentance, and a new heart. Now, in order to understand that, you gotta understand what grace is. Of course, mercy is when we don't get something we deserve, and grace is when we do get something we don't deserve. And so we look at grace in those terms as the grace of exposure, the grace of repentance, and the grace of a new heart. I think about this grace of exposure, and most of you are in here with me, and you're in the same boat, and you say, man, Brother Tony, I spend my whole life avoiding exposure. (laughs) I spend my whole life praying that nobody is going to find out 
what I've done. It's ironic in my mind, and, and I know I've done it too, that we pray that God would protect us from the consequences of the sin that we've done against God, that we would not <clears throat> be exposed in our life, that we could hide and get away with our sin. It's, it, it's a grace, though, that we could experience the exposure of our sin, whether the exposure that comes from being found out or the exposure that comes from our own confession. It seems as though we need to realize that there is a grace in exposure. Think about it this way. If we were to live our life heaped in our sin, never forgiven, never healed, then we would never be able to get free from the things we've done in the past. Now, I want you to know that we cannot heal the things that are hidden in our life. If we continue to hide the things in our life, then they will continue to fester. They will be infected. They will continue to grow. It'll be like a cancer that overtakes our entire life. I think about the story of David, and he was exposed, right? David, if you don't know the story, had really begun to think he had gotten away with it. With what, you may ask? Well, of course, David had done some pretty rotten things. I won't get too deep into the story, perhaps, but in, in David and 2 Samuel, we find out that David had stayed home in the palace while everybody else was out to war. He was there in his palace, and he was roaming around, and he was bored. You know, he was a warrior, so he liked to be in the battle. He was a, he was a poet, so he's son of a romantic guy. He was the Renaissance man in those days. He did it all. He could kill you, and he could kill you with his words and kindness, but David was back in the palace, and he was roaming around his palace, and it it says that he was up and he looked out and he saw a really beautiful woman bathing on her roof. And David looked, of course, but David didn't just look, he, he stared. And then he coveted. And then he asked for her. And he brought her into him. And they had relations. And she went home. Of course, this was, thanks, Raj. Of course, this was um, Uriah's wife. Uriah was one of David's prized soldiers. David had inquired who was the woman before he brought her up to him, and his attendant said, it is Uriah's wife. It's, it's off limits. She is not for you. But David said, I want her anyway. Give her to me. And so David got her. The problem is, after she went back, a couple of months later, he finds out that she's pregnant. And then he didn't know what to do. What am I going to do? David thought, and so David decided, well, I'm going to bring Uriah back from the battle, and it'll look like he's the father. But Uriah was way more godly than David, so Uriah d d decided he wasn't going to sleep with his wife. Well, that's a big problem now for David. David doesn't know exactly what he's going to do, so he takes a letter, and he writes a letter, and he sends it back to the battlefield with Uriah, and that, ba that letter said, send Uriah out to the front lines, and when the battle is at its hottest, you pull everybody back but Uriah. And of course, it was a death sentence. Uriah died. David was able to take Bathsheba as his own wife, and the baby is born, and David thinks, I've gotten away with it. You ever thought you got away with it? You ever roamed around life thinking you were more clever than everybody else around you? I'm sure most of us have been in that place. Of course, this is where David found himself. He thought he was scot-free. The baby is sick. Nathan, the prophet of Israel and a friend of David's, comes to David, knocks on his door and walks in and decides to tell David a story. And he tells David this story. I won't tell you all the details, but the story simply says, there was a man who wanted something from a poor man, and he took it. And he left the poor man with nothing. And David's furious. David is so angry. David says, that man should die. Of course, it was in that moment that David's world came crashing down again. Nathan looked David in the eye and said, you are the man. David a man of great power, a man of great wealth, a man of great stature, was there broken completely by his sin. He was found out. He had thought he had gotten away with it. But you know, God, God sees all the things that we don't think anybody else sees. How many of you have ever tried to hide something from God? It's, uh, it's crazy how we do that. I know that in my life, I've, 
I've tried to hide things from God. In fact, there was uh, a time of about six months in my life prior to my world breaking apart that I lived a double life and tried to hide it from everyone. If I hadn't been exposed, I would have had to remain in that state, which was an incredibly broken state. You can't live life as two different people. You see, I was trying to live life as two people, and I didn't like either one of them. I was going about my daily life. I was preaching of all things, all the while harboring a secret in my heart. It was a grace of God to open up my life and expose my sin. I'm not saying that every one of us has to stand up in front of everyone and tell your deepest, darkest sin. That was my lot. That was exactly what I had to do, but it's not typically what we all have to do. But it's good for us to have our sin exposed so that we can heal from that which is causing so much pain. We will never heal our sin if we continue to hide it. So David had his sin exposed, and David's response is what we read today. It was that psalm that ought to become the anthem of every Christian. We never graduate beyond it because we're still in this body. Even the apostle Paul wrestled with sin throughout his life and said, it's that stuff I don't wanna do that I do, and it's the stuff I I do wanna do that I can't do. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Paul understood it, do we? That exposure is meant to lead us toward repentance. Of course, that's what happened to David. His exposure led him to repentance. This grace of repentance, it's a grace because we don't, we don't deserve that. We don't even warrant it in our life. God doesn't have to give us an opportunity to repent of our sin. I'm always surprised in the Bible when I read the Bible and God lets people who are wicked get away for a while and give them time to repent and be restored. I'm always, I'm always shocked when God doesn't kill me on the spot. I know some of you aren't like that. You think, man, I, I can't believe God has wrath. I can't believe God judges sinners. Well, I can't believe God forgives sinners. I don't know about you, but it blows me away to know that that's a possibility. And of course, David knows that, and it leads him to this repentance. There's a grace in David's repentance. And in case you don't know what repentance is, I wanted to, I wanted to break it down a little bit for us because repentance, um, I think some of us get it mixed up. Obviously, repentance, the word, it means to change, to change direction or to change your mind. The first thing I think that is an ingredient in true repentance is that we actually hate our sin. You know, David came to, to God and, and David threw himself on the mercy of God have mercy on me, O God. And he didn't throw himself on the mercy of of God because he thought he was better than everybody else. He didn't say, God, because I am David the king, have mercy on me. In fact, he threw himself on the mercy of God in spite of himself and because of the great nature of his great God. He threw himself on the mercy of God and said, God, according to your steadfast love, have mercy on me. David didn't waffle back and forth. David didn't do any of the things that I'm going to talk about in a moment that our tendencies are to do. He just threw himself on the mercy of God. Why? Because he learned to hate his sin. He didn't hate his consequences. How many of you get caught and then you just get so tore up that there's consequences to your sin? You get caught and you're like, man, I can't believe they caught me. (laughs) <laughs> we're just sorry we got caught. Anybody like that, or is it just Pastor Tony? We're sorry we got caught. We're not sorry that we did it. We no more intend to not do it again than the man in the moon. We just want nobody to know so we don't get in trouble. I was really famous for this as a kid. I said I was sorry all the time, all the time. Love to say I'm sorry. God, I'm just sorry. Why? Because I didn't want to get punished. And I thought sorry was a magic word. Now, was I Sorry. No, no, I was still going to eat everything in the house. I was still going to do whatever, right? I, I wasn't sorry. I just was sorry there was consequences to my bad behavior, to my sin. But, 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 but even on a deeper level, how many of us can say we've ever come to that place where we see our sin exactly the way God sees it? Now, that's a different level. 
where we see our sin and we are absolutely broken by it. David threw himself on the mercy of God and said, cleanse me. Um, and he talks about his, his transgressions, his iniquity, his sin. If you read the passage, he uses all of this colorful language talking about his sin. Why? Because he was trying to understand and trying to help us understand that he absolutely hated what he had done. The consequences were all over for David, really. I mean, he had to he had to experience some natural consequences, but, but really legally and all the rest of the ways, he didn't have to deal with it. Uriah was gone. He was able to marry Bathsheba. He thought he had gotten away with it, but he hated in that moment, he hated his sin, which led him to turn from his sin. Oh man, I'm telling you, so often we miss repentance because we're not willing to turn from our sin. Does that mean we never sin again? No, but it means that we have the intention to follow God so closely that we're turning from our sin. If you can imagine somebody coming up every week and rededicating their life or praying and saying, God, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna do it again. <laughs> and walking out of this place with every intention to keep on sinning. We never really come to a place of repentance until we turn from our sin until we hate our sin enough that it repulses us enough that we turn from our sin. And not only do we turn from our sin, but we turn to God. You know, God is the only one to whom we can go. The problem is God is the only one that we are ashamed to go see when we realize we've messed up. God is the one that we know is the judge and the righteous and the holy and the God that we can love. But just like Adam, we want to hide from him every time we mess up. Anybody else or just me? So we realize that we turn from our sin, we turn to God. Another thing that has to happen in true repentance is we have to not minimize our sin. You ever done that? You ever said, man, I'm not like so-and-so. It's good in the South. A lot of good Christians in the South think they're Christians because they ain't killed nobody, right? I ain't killed nobody, pastor. I ain't killed. Well, I don't. I, have you been mad at your brother? Okay, Jesus said if you're mad at him, you've killed him in your heart already. None of us are guiltless. None of us are innocent. None of us can say that we are righteous in and of ourselves. And so we can't minimize the sin in our life. One other way we do that is we look at other people, we see their sin, and we get angry at their sin, but we have a defense attorney in our own hearts that's wearing a baggy suit and bad shoes, and he tries to justify everything you and I do. You ever have one of those? And I think of my cousin Vinny. I mean, I think of the movie and all of this bad attorney that just says, you're just in what you've done. We minimize our sin. Maybe you don't minimize it. Maybe you do like David did. You try to cover it up. Anybody ever do that? But the more you try to cover it up, the worse it gets. The more, if, if my dog digs a hole in the backyard and he tries to cover it up by digging, does that help? No, he's digging. You keep digging holes, and you keep trying to fill one hole with another hole. And that's the way our sin grows. We can't just try to cover up our sin because our sin will always find us out. Listen to what happened to David. He, he had an adulterous affair. He didn't have a mistake. He didn't have a lapse of judgment. He sinned against God. He called it for what it was, and he didn't or he quit trying to cover it up, but before he did, he tried, right? He tried to cover it up. He wanted to bring Uriah in. He tried to get Uriah drunk. None of it worked, so he killed Uriah and married Bathsheba. He tried to cover up his sin. You can't try to cover up your sin because as long as you're covering it up, you will never come to true repentance. As long as we cover the things in our life and try to cover them and hide them, we will never come to true repentance. They will eat us alive. Do you know that you're not stronger than your sin and the effects thereof? You're not stronger than your sin or the effects thereof because we have to come to grips with it. And the only way is through true and faithful repentance. Of course, that's what David did. David didn't try to cover it up or minimize it or hide it. He didn't attempt to live with it. Some of us, we have the attitude, it is what it is, right? I've done it, I'm gonna live with it. So we don't really worry, we just try to live. And we wonder why we walk around miserable. 
We wonder why our health is affected. We wonder why our, all of our relationships busted. Our relationships are busted because our heart is busted because we've not gone to the same and only place that can fix a busted heart. We've never gotten to that place of true repentance. Of course, true repentance is a gift of God, which leads us to a new heart. The grace of a new heart is, is the most encouraging part of that whole story today is that, that when David cries out and throws himself on the mercy seat of God, he asks God to create in him a new heart. Uh, I was listening to a sermon by a guy named Alistair Begg. Anybody know of Alistair Begg? Okay, a few of you. <laughs> I just figured out who the nerds were in the room. So, But I wrote this down, and I don't write a lot of stuff down, but I wanted to write it down because I thought it was so good. He says that when we sin... It's not enough for a psychologist to help us through it, although that's important and can help. He says that it's not enough for the person that I hurt to forgive me. He said it's not even enough to feel badly for what I've done, and it's not enough for me to be angry with myself for having done it. All of those things are important, but none of those things can bring true healing and repentance. If indeed we have been saved, if indeed we have been um, rescued by God, we have been given the only thing that can fix any of this, and that is a new heart. David said, he, he said he was a man after God's own heart. The Bible even said so. But David, when he cried out before God, says, God created me a new heart. I need a new heart. My heart is broken. I need a new one. So many times we come to church to throw band-aids on a broken heart, and it never works because we leave this place exactly the way we were when we came in. What I want you to know today is that the grace of a new heart is available for all of us who will truly before God repent and confess. You see, that new heart creates in us the freedom to worship. You read the psalm. He said, God, open up my mouth and I will praise you. Create in me a clean heart. And that's going to result in this bursting forth of song. I will be able to worship you with my life. I won't be restricted and held back. I won't, I won't cower before you, but I will praise you for your holiness. It gives us freedom to worship. The grace of a new heart also gives us freedom from guilt. You heard what he said. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O Lord. You might say, I'm not blood guilty. I've not killed anybody. But the reality is we are blood guilty. None of us are, are, are exempt from the anger that wells up within us that if left unchecked is going to result in murder. None of us are exempt from breaking the first 10 commandments, right? None of us are exempt. We've all been there and done that. But a new heart gives us freedom from that guilt. How many of you and you don't have to raise your hand, please don't, but live your life completely shackled by guilt from your past. And, and guilt, even one worse, is shame. Guilt says, hey, I did something bad. Shame says, I am bad. Like, I am bad. I, I, I'm bad. I, I need a new heart. So grace of a new heart is the freedom from shame. Grace of a new heart also gives us power to heal the brokenness inside of us. You know, when my sin first came to the table, I was so broken by everything that had happened. And, and here, here's the thing, it was all self-inflicted. But self-inflicted pain still hurts. If I punch myself in the face, is it gonna hurt? Yes, this is yes. Some of you are just staring at me. It is. So self-inflicted -inflict pain still hurts, but, but whenever I was going through all of that, I knew instinctively that the only one that I needed to throw myself on from the very beginning was Jesus. And whenever I did that, I, I then had the power to do the work that it takes to heal it gives us freedom to walk. You know, when we confess our sin and repent before the Lord Jesus Christ, he is faithful to forgive us of our sin. 
He's faithful. He's a faithful God. And did you know that, that we can be restored, renewed, and released, but still walk with the limp? Did you know that we can, we can be absolutely set free by God and like Jacob still walk with a limp from the consequences of our, of our natural consequences of our sin? We realize that as we come to him, he will forgive us, although we may still have to go through some pretty difficult times to receive the healing that God wants to give us. But it can't even start until we repent so that he can heal us in our life. You know, a little update as I close today, and, and I know preachers all the time, they say, as I close, and then go on 30 minutes more, but I'm not gonna do that. But I will say, as I close today, there's a little update. I, it's been seven years since my sin was exposed and since my wife had filed for divorce, and um, I, I'm thankful that today, seven years later, they're here, my wife and my kids. We managed to stay together because of her willingness to do the hard work of reconciliation and no, lo no less part in my willingness to throw myself on the mercy of God and ask God to heal me and create in me a clean heart. Now, I'm not perfect today, I, I wasn't perfect then, but I will say that I'm better now than I was then. And that our marriage is getting stronger, at least from my perspective, as a guy, I don't know what she's thinking, would never tell you that, but from my perspective, it's getting better every day. And that would have never happened if there hadn't have been for the exposure, for the repentance, and the new heart. Friends, even as a pastor, I need a new heart, but here's the thing, I still walk with a limp. You ever, you ever wanted and prayed for God to help you not remember your sin in the past? God, I know you, you put my sin as far as the east is from the west and you remember it no more. God, help me not remember it. But did you know that I am thankful that I remember what I did? I am thankful that I remember where I was. Why? Because it's part of who I am today. It also protects me. How, how does it protect me? It protects me just like when God gave us the ability to remember things in our life, it acts as a protection. Think about a kid that has um, touched a hot stove. What if he didn't remember? What if he would forget? Oh, he's forgetting my past mistakes. He forgot his past mistakes, walks back, grabs the stove again. It gets burned again. We'd be getting burned over and over and over. It would be awful if we couldn't remember because we would never have protection from our stupid selves. But I thank God that I remember because I have protection. I know how weak I am. Anybody else? And I know how to be protected. And I know that daily I have to come on my knees before the Lord and say, have mercy on me, O God. Today, I may walk with a limp, but I walk nonetheless. No, no, I, I soar on the wings of eagles because I know the power of God in Christ Jesus to put it all back together. I'm gonna pray and we're gonna worship again. This is a time of response. I don't want anybody to leave until you get absolutely transparent before God today. I was shaken when I came up here. Not because of the word, I'm comfortable with that. But the transparency that I don't necessarily love. Anybody else? Let's get before God today. And if there's anything keeping you from having that freedom in him, this altar is open. There are people here who will talk to you. Don't get out of here until you do it. Let me pray. God, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for these people, and I thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, I thank you that you have intersected our lives even this day, that you have taught us, that you have loved us, that you have reminded us of who we are in you. God, I pray that we would always come to you in boldness and ask for your Forgiveness because of Jesus. And God, I pray for everybody in this place that you would help them to know that they can be forgiven and free in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, let's stand. And as Joe mentioned last Sunday, for those of you that were not here, and I so appreciate his word and closing.
last Sunday. This is not a time for you to go grab your kids. This is not a time for you to just head out the back door, high five friends on the way out, chit chat and carry on. This is a time, as Pastor Tony just said, to respond. And maybe you don't have anything to lay down and you don't have anything that God's dealing with on your heart, but the person next to you, maybe they do. And I guarantee you, you know somebody in your life that needs to be prayed over. This is what this time is for. Let's spend it in reverence all of the understanding of who our God is that we've come to worship. Amen. In these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered mended Take our weakness and shed your treasure in jars of clay. So take this heart, Lord, I'll be your vessel, the one to see your life in me. Oh, amazing grace, how sweet. Saved a wretch like me, cause I once was lost, but now I am found. Just blind, but now I see. Oh, I can see you now, and I can see.
praise you, God, that you don't miss a single sliver. Not one of the tiniest pieces falls from your hands. You don't forget where you place them. You don't lay them down and then don't remember where you put it. You don't miss a thing. And you gather all of our brokenness and you gather every part of our lives that was shattered into a billion pieces. And you mold and you craft and you create us into these beautiful vessels for your glory and your name's sake. Praise you and hallelujah, God. And I pray as we leave and we go about our week, Lord, that from Monday to Saturday and our busyness and work and kids and our schedules, God, that we will stop daily and be reminded of what we've been healed and saved from. And a song of thanksgiving and praise will leave our mouths worthy as the lamb that was slain for our sins. Beautiful name, Jesus Christ, we pray. And all the saints said, Amen. Beautiful and how glorious.